Hey everybody, I'm Pastor DJ and welcome to that podcast. With me as always is Sarah DeYoung, Pastor Mark Soljum, as always with us. I'm uh, as always now. Two episodes and I'm as always. <laughs> and today we have a new guest, Pastor Becky Lee. As, hey Becky. As occasionally. As, as yep. special guest star host. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I've finally um, been told that I'm not allowed to use the sound buttons anymore uh, by me personally yeah. because I failed so many times. So we'll let you, someone you else fired yourself from I your fired own job. myself. I was that poor at it. It's just like you're done. You're out of here. So you had a moment of self realization. Is that I, what's I, going on here? An epiphany, if you will. An epiphany. Yes. Not are just there? a season in the church. <laughs> no. <laughs> moment of clarity when you realize just how worthless you are at something. So. Yes. Are there any buttons here that will embarrass us if I push them? Well, there's a, well, maybe. Uh, just start pushing buttons. Let's how, see what happens. How embarrassed uh, do you get? To, I don't know. There's some. Yeah, that's there's, pretty There's one of them. There right you there, go. It's right there. Do we want to start the podcast over? Right, no. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> you didn't tell me. <laughs> well, you might notice that um, our, our fearless host, yeah. uh, Ryan Janke, is not with us. He's still enjoying some well-earned uh, quality time with his family away mm. from this uh, crazy Hopefully he's having a riveting uh, vacation. I hope so. And hopefully resting his voice and not saying that at every moment. (laughs) Otherwise his wife probably will throw him out of the car. His poor children. (laughs) So, but he'll be back soon. And uh, we're, we're glad for him to get, get Mm -hmm. some quality time away. So what's going on, Sarah? How's life? Good. It's, it's getting to feel like fault in my mind, at least. So I, Yay! Yeah, I've been. It's time. I put out my pumpkins in my office that I go up to once a week, and you have your pumpkin spice colored I shirt do. on today. Yes, you I'm, do. I'm slowly getting ready for fall. That's right. Pumpkin spice season yep. is almost here. August 24th. I read a. I read really? it about it. It's the official it's a, day. It's a rumor that it, that's when it's coming out. So August 24th, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That seems way too soon for pumpkin spice. Wow. I was at the grocery store the other day. They were putting out the Halloween candy. Really? Yep. Now, do you all like Halloween candy? Is there like like the the stuff that just comes out at Halloween, the little corn candy corn things? Not a fan. Is is Dove Dark <laughs> considered a Halloween candy? Because that's that's you know you know is that when you get a craving for that's it? That's all it season thing? long, so it's all year long. In my opinion, there's something, and this is a every season candy. The Reese's like pumpkin or like tree, mm. whatever yep. egg. It's better than any other Reese's. That's it. The yeah. size Reese's. That's mm-hmm. my Halloween. That's the only one. Yeah, those are good. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm a Reese's of every season, but no. yeah, I, I get with it too. With the just good. The you're, seasons. You're an aficionado, oh. I think, aren't you? You're you? a connoisseur, a, a our local yeah. expert. Yeah, I na- I love them so much. I named my daughter <laughs> after the candy. <laughs> yes, it was actually the nurse who named um, Reese because we gave the nurse two names because we weren't sure when she was born, and the nurse took a good look at her and said, "She's Reese." So. That's a good method. Yeah, that's let let's, let a complete mm-hmm. stranger yeah. decide <laughs> who will bring her into the world. Well, thirty years from now, you can go. You know, we really didn't like that. We'll blame that nurse. Yeah, that's that. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. So I'm wondering if um, the the Olympics, the 2020 Olympics, has finally mm-hmm. arrived in 2021, and it has uh, been on for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Were you all into the Olympics? Did you pay attention? Anybody? I was for the first week. Right. And I forgot. <laughs> I think I watched, we watched um, maybe like an hour of the opening ceremony and I watched 10 minutes of the closing ceremony and then some of the swimmers and that's pretty much all we got into. So no one was really into it. I I guess our family was, our family was more into it. We watched quite a bit of Olympics um, just because there were some new categories that were really fun this year. The BMX bike Mm -hmm. stuff was very interesting to me Um, and the skateboarding was fascinating. Um, But so we tried to, we don't have cable. So we basically can watch whatever NBC watched. And then I thought, oh, I'll solve this problem and I'll sign up for Peacock for, uh, you know, a couple sure. months to try that out. Well, w- what a what a mess watching the Olympics via streaming was. I mean, you couldn't watch live any place without – basically, they wanted you to have cable. Right. And if you didn't have cable, they wanted you to sign up for cable. Right. So Peacock showed events but showed them like 24 to 36 hours afterwards. And so – yeah. And so that's, that's the thing with like, um, 
the internet and social media nowadays that yeah. you find out all the results long before you get to see them because they're right. only so much later. My daughter was excited to watch the U.S. Uh, women's soccer team, but they always played at about three or four in the morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that was I was really excited to watch softball because this was the first year it was back. Yeah. And I think the gold medal game was like two a.m. on a Thursday. Mm -hmm. It's like. You weren't up to that. Gonna stay up for that. Yeah, I do like when the Olympics come around, though. Like more than than even regular sports. It's just mm -hmm. there's something special about yeah. it. But after two weeks, it just we're not a big sports household, mm -hmm. um, and yet we love watching the Olympics. I I think uh, it's just fun. Mm -hmm. So well, and if if you've tuned into stuff at Atonement, we have something very exciting to announce. We are now going to be training up the next generation of Olympic rock climbers competitive rock climbers because that's a new olympic sport mm -hmm. was rock climbing and we have this great new which rock was climbing crazy world. if yeah. you watched any yeah. of that mm -hmm. they're like quick they'd scale the wall in like was six seconds was it timed was yeah that yes that? Okay. racing mm -hmm. wow yeah it was pretty it was pretty intense pretty neat and i'm excited to see what we can do now that yeah. we have a uh an updated rock climbing wall we might have to adjust the the goal times a little bit down you know like oh if you make it up there in 60 seconds that's good yeah instead of six yeah i think wow. though if we're going to put the next like olympic style training center my request would be for a uh, olympic canoeing if anybody canoeing. watched that that was cool it, it they looked like they were <laughs> half human half boat mm. so do we need to add like a moat into the arc as well now Oh, just yeah. cross the way. Yeah, we'll just take over the uh, golf course. <laughs> golf <pond. laughs> just invade Rose Creek. <laughs> <laughs> and they, the the only ones that goes it are the geese. I mean, yeah, that's true. Sure. And the that's bad true. golfers. <laughs> well, we could <laughs> scoop up some of them golf balls. There you go. Oy vey. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, so um, Mark and I were talking earlier about a book that we've been reading um, as a staff. What's the name of that book that we've been reading? Uh, um now, <laughs> I didn't write it down, and I don't have it in front of me. Jesus the King. <laughs> Jesus the King, yes, by uh, Timothy Keller. Yeah, love this book. It's, I, I recommend it to everybody. I mean, it, it is really a good read. It's very approachable. If yeah. you, you know, you don't have to be a, 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 a theologian to uh, get into it. I think it's very approachable. And it follows the, uh, the book of Mark uh, through and, and deals with, uh, Jesus's teachings and actions throughout the book of Mark. Right. And every week, uh, in our staff meeting, we, we try to set some across time. We don't always have enough time to do it, but we take time as a staff as we've been reading through it to kind of review and, and have a conversation about each of the chapters. And the latest chapter <coughs> is entitled the stain. Uh, I, this is, this is, I, I think for me, this is a, uh, this is kind of getting at the heart of the matter in the book. Um, you know, so I just kind of wanted to, to ask about like, was there something that, that really stood out to you about this chapter, Mark, or, or, in, you know, about, about the human, the human predicament that we're in. So if you'd like, you could pause the podcast right now, go to Amazon, buy the book, uh, read this chapter or, or the whole book, and then come back to us. We'll That's wait. Right. We'll wait. Okay, how did you enjoy it? <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I guess for me, I, I think it I, just the way that it read really spoke to me about regardless of whether you believe in God or believe in anything. Well, let's lay down a little foundation okay. for what this chapter is talking ahead. about. Because all we've said is, hey, we read this book and there's a chapter <laughs> called The Stain. Right. Um, this chapter, uh, he delves into a... Um, what we may all have and, and may not be able to uh, put words to, but have a nagging sense that something's not right, um, that the world isn't perfect, that I'm not perfect, that, that there's just you know, a nagging sense that, that there must be something more or I'm missing something or a, a longing that we all have and, and that manifests itself different for different people. You know? um, what is the matrix? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Do you want the blue pill or the red pill? <laughs> I was thinking about that earlier today. I think that's similar, but not. <laughs> but I, I, you know, you think about uh, um, when you come up against uh, evil in the world, and you wonder why is there evil. When you come up against uh, limitations of yourself, why do I uh, feel lonely sometimes? Why do I um, just have this nagging sense that I may not be good enough on on something and 
And we try and fill those voids with all sorts of things, don't we? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, even like in the Alpha course, they quote Jim Carrey, and I'm going to get the quote wrong, but it, it's basically along the lines of Jim well, Carrey saying, I, I wish everyone would become rich and famous so that they could see that that isn't the answer. All righty then. <laughs> that, rich, that Jim <laughs> that Carrey? That Jim Carrey. <laughs> oh, wow. And... um it, it, that no that's that's the only time you'll have me doing any celebrity impressions. I just want to. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. That's it. That's all we get. That's, Let's hear it again. No, no, no. <laughs> that was it. Um, Don't quote me on that though. That and we uh, there's some point where Nikki Gumbel says that Freddie Mercury kind of ended up in that same place. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Freddie yes. Mercury says along the same thing yeah. too. He has all this money, all these fans, mm -hmm. untoward. Um, celebrity and yet feels incredibly incredibly alone yeah yeah i i mean uh you hear that quite often uh celebrities will will say that they for a long time they've longed for for fame thinking that that would fill the hole for them and so they work towards that and then when they achieve that they wake up the next day not feeling any different right so success will do that yeah so you know when we talk about when, when what the chapter talks about as the stain is what I got thinking of as and I don't remember if he ever actually says this anywhere, but that this is what this is what original sin is. It's, it's yeah, he talks about this. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if he uses that language, but well, so the example that he uses in the book I think is fascinating because he talks about um, intellectuals in Britain right after World War II. And because there was an intellectual class that that thought, well, we could just take care of all of these human problems with better education, with, uh, you know, improved this and improved that. And we can just better our way out of this. Um, and they sort of discounted original sin, mm -hmm. which is what um, we I'll, I'll, I'll have one of you give a definition for that here. But um, what they couldn't come up against was the heinous acts that they saw within the war right like how could an educated society fall to this right 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 yeah that was the um the uh, the thinking up until the the 20th century was uh rationalism and the enlightenment that we're going to keep getting better and better as a as a humanity as a whole and we're going to end up solving all of the world's problems mm -hmm. But then World War One hit, and then World War Two, and it was like, okay, we've greatly mischaracterized or recognized the the sinfulness within mm -hmm. within humanity, the selfishness, the 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 great. Um, you and I were talking about it earlier, but I think like there's this inborn myth of just deep hopelessness. Um, that no matter what I do, no matter what I am, I'll never be satisfied. I'll never be uh, the, the Alexander are, Hamilton felt the same. I mean, is that right? Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, it, he did in the musical, I guess. Oh, <laughs> never be satisfied. He said, right? I'll never be satisfied, but he sang about it. <laughs> he did sing about it, but there is a sort of a, it, he was talking about his restless ambition, but, um, I mean, I, I, I think others, I, I have a sense of this and, and maybe others do that, that, um, that uh, you, you know, no matter what you have, it just doesn't seem to fill that that goal. That doesn't seem to satisfy you. And mm -hmm. I know different personalities think of that differently. Um, mine, but but a lot of humans, I think, think that you know, if I only had this, I'd be a little bit happier. Mm -hmm. If I only had that, mm -hmm. that satisfaction, that hole that you're talking about. Yeah. What do you think, Pastor Becky? Well, yes. Yeah. We do have it. We do have this longing for, I don't know, to know that I have been of worth, of value. And sometimes you wonder, what have I done? Yeah. Yeah. If I only had one more dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then an that'll do it. <laughs> and an RV camper, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then just retire and go into oblivion Yeah, with mm -hmm. the dog and the camper. But that won't work. Yeah. That won't work. And the whole thing is you talked about original sin, Mark. And that's the idea that we are born human and because of the of the first sin that it, we all inherit that. Mm -hmm. And that uh, nothing we can do about it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's there. It's there. And so, you know, I remember this room used to be filled with babies mm -hmm. when we had a child care. And all you had to do was stand 
for two or three minutes and watch them. And somebody would say, how could those little ones be sinners? And then you'd see him grab a toy and whack the other one away. (laughs) 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 And you'd go, oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Okay. (laughs) There it is. The greed, the vengeance, the whole thing. It was all in one- and two-year-olds. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, it's in us. Yeah. And so that's the part that you were talking about, Mark. Mm-hmm. That, that comes with us that a lot of people don't acknowledge. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there's an inborn. It's like, it's like we're, we're constantly self evaluating and at the same time, self critiquing and self celebrating. That's that, that selfishness, that being turned in on yourself. That uh, is how like Martin Luther talked about original sin. It's, it's, it's staring at your own belly button. It's being turned in on yourself. And that the way we then relate to the world is if I can just get the world to work the way that I want it to work, then I'll be right. Or if I can just get God, if I can just figure out how to be right with God, then I'll, then everything will be right. Everything will go my way. Um, and it's, it's that lack of trust in God to be your God and more wanting to be really our, our own gods, our own masters of our own de- destiny um, that plays out in all kinds of ways. But it's like it's, it, there's never a sense of satisfaction, which is interesting with what um, I looked up on the Urban Dictionary. You mentioned this, this phrase uh, to me. I've got, I'm looking at the same thing. A day or two ago? Yes, yes. Well, should I explain how we get, got here before you explain <laughs> yeah. the definition of it? So, uh you, you know, we talk about sort of um, um, starting one place on the internet and ending up in some place totally mm-hmm. different when based upon what's recommended to you. Well, on, on YouTube, I was looking up some stuff and I ended up on this site talking about loneliness. Um, and I thought, well, this is interesting because I'm, you know, I'm a student of human nature. And, and so I, I find when people try and um, explain this or whatnot. And I thought it was so interesting because... Um, they were, ex- they were talking about loneliness. Um, and there's two parts to the video. The, the first part was, um, well, the second part was talking about that one was easier. The second part was talking about, um, when you feel lonely, here are some things that you can do to help sort of a, uh, self help type of thing or, or, you know, some therapy issues to work through. But the first half was sort of fascinating because it was a look at, uh, a biological look at why we feel lonely, and they were making the an argument that evolution has led us to need one another, and to uh, um, for our own survival. So then, biologically, it's built into us to need one another, and so when we don't have one another, then we feel lonely. So they were saying it was a a biological um, uh, evolution that we got to a point now where we need people because mm-hmm. our, of that whole thing. And I thought, well, that, that's a very... It's a survival instinct. Then. Yeah. Yes. And, and it's a very sort of... Because back in the day, if you were by yourself, a dinosaur would just come and clomp on you. But with a couple of them, you just had to out, outrun the slower ones behind right, you. Right. That's the point. I yeah, gotcha. Hang out with slow people. <laughs> that, that's the, that was the, the point of the video, I'm pretty sure. Um, but it was... Uh, no, I just totally lost where we were. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that was good. That was good. But it was totally a way to look at it. Um, you know, obviously, it, it was a non-theological way to look at it. It was very sort of um, um, separated from any sort of religious beliefs. Mm-hmm. Because I watched it, and immediately I thought, I know what that hole is that you're talking about. They were talking about a hole. They were dancing around the hole by talking about loneliness, and then they talked about needing one another. And I thought, you're talking about the desire that we have for relationship. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've talked about this before. The desire that we have for relationship is, is um, I believe, comes from God. Mm-hmm. A desire for him and a desire for one another, a desire for to love God and to be in community. And that, I believe that's part of what God has built into us. And so when they explained it with, you know, well, when we were hunters and gatherers, we needed one another so the dinosaur wouldn't eat us Mm -hmm. um, because we were slow. Uh, And I thought, I think you're missing something there. So I went and looked at what, where the video came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, the description of the, the site said, optimistic nihilism. 
or nihilism. I was going to say, now, did you mean optimistic nihilism? Because yes. I don't know which Depending upon uh, which way you want to pronounce it. <laughs> we were just having that discussion earlier. Which way to pronounce Potato, it? Potato, tomato. Yes. Optimistic, optimistic tomatoes. Uh, <laughs> optimistic nihilism. And uh, so it was an interesting discussion because uh, you've got your urban dictionary there. What is, what, what yeah, typically so, does nihilism so, mean? Let's talk about that first. Well, and I thought it was really interesting, and I want to sh- I want to share something after reading this because um, w- w- terms like nihilism, you're talking about Western philosophy, so it's not like like these ideas aren't in other parts of the world, but the way we're going to define them has to do with. Well, the video what? did come out of Germany. So, well, there, uh, I there mean, you go. And that was that was sort of the birthplace to this. You can look at at two worldviews as coming together over two thousand years ago to define current Western thought. You had Greek philosophy and you had Christianity. And that's, we can look at all Western culture and, and measure it based on those two ways of thinking because they're inbred in our DNA if you're in the Western part of the world. Um, and nihilism is, is a Greek philosophy. So this idea of optimistic nihilism or nihilism, I thought was really interesting. It says all life is meaningless. That's what nihilism means. All, there is no meaning. Does and nihilism that, mean the same thing? It, I think it does. It's, it's yeah, very, okay. Very fatalistic. I view. think nihilism is more like meaningless life is, kind of like Yoda. Uh, Yoda was a nihilist. Mm, I think. Yes. Um, and that's what makes it oh, wonderful. I said I was so, yeah. gonna, not going to do any more impersonations. We got two Sorry. impersonations. Okay. Mm. It means that if the universe has no purpose, time will go on without you. Then you don't matter. That makes you optimistic, wow. I guess. All humiliation or guilt or sadness or anger that you may have felt will disappear. So there you have this sense of all the bad stuff you feel bad about is not going to go on for forever. It has an end, Um, which is kind of an interesting way of thinking about justice, I guess. If life has no purpose, give it one. Uh, Make use of the time you have. Enjoy it while it lasts. Eat, drink, and be merry. Ooh, that's in the Bible somewhere. It is. Isn't that, isn't that, couple times. Isn't that kind of what that sounds like, though? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's very similar to what's what you just quoted is is kind of the th- phrase for Epicureanism, Bless or you. thank you, um, or or what's called hedonism. Mm-hmm. Um, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. And in Epicureanism, they weren't concerned as to whether there was an afterlife or not. Just that the ultimate goal of life was pleasure, mm-hmm. and pleasure doesn't just mean like vices. It just meant that you were had maximum pleasure with minimum pain, kind of like Buddhism. So, continue reading this though, because I think that the the second paragraph, uh, that's a quote uh, by I. You help go me ahead. You that read name. It. I, I Kurz, 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 Yeah, that one. <laughs> you read Here's it. What go he ahead. said, Opt, optimistic nihilism. You only get one shot at life, which is scary, but it also sets you free. If the universe ends in heat death, every humiliation you suffer in your life will be forgotten. Every mistake you made will not matter in the end. Every bad thing you did will be voided. If your life is all we get to experience, then it's the only thing that matters. If the universe has no principles, the only principles relevant are the ones we decide on. If the universe has no purpose, then we get to dictate what its purpose is. We are truly free in a universe-sized playground, so we might as well aim to be happy and to build some kind of utopia in the stars. There you go. Is that where YOLO comes from? Probably. i got to explain more. You You only live once. once. YOLO. Oh, very good. You didn't know that one? Mm -mm. Don't get that confused with Yoda. Yeah, Yeah, Well, that's that's where my mind was going at at first. (laughs) I was trying to remember the little guy's name in Mandalorian. Isn't it something (laughs) like that, too? Uh, no, that's, uh, uh, oh, you're going to put me on the spot again. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Grogu. Grogu. But, it, but reading this reminds me a lot of our culture today. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm going to make my own rules. There are no absolutes. So I will, I will decide what I like. I will do as I please. And yeah. And there will be nothing to hold me back from it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I mentioned that there are, um, in my opinion, four, old Greek philosophies that have been with Western culture for a long time, but have been dominated by a Christian worldview have come to an emergence in our postmodern age in the last 20 years. And, and nihilism is one of them. 
So it, it, just to share this with you, two um, out of the four philosophies, two sets have merged. Um, the first one is, is Platonism. And Platonism is this idea that uh, there is um, everything physical is um, not good. It's bad. Uh, it's because it decays and falls apart. But then there's the spiritual. So Plato would say that things in heaven is good, the spiritual is good, the physical is bad. That's kind of like Gnosticism. It is, okay. yeah. Gnosticism grows out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but where he differentiates is to say that what is the spiritual? It's ideas, it's um, your thoughts, and it's your feelings, who you are inside. It's where the Greek idea of the, of the soul comes from, which is slightly different from the Christian idea. And so if you think about like, the current talks in our culture is about how do you identify yourself? Well, that's right out of Platonism. Your identity matters more than what's physically there because the physical is mortal and it's going to die away. And a good test that I share what I've shared with students before is I'll put a list on a, of a piece of paper and I'll say, okay, there's six things and I want you to group them together. The six things are God, heaven, angels, earth, rocks, um, people. So which, which go with which put them in, in two, two categories. And often what you get is, well, the first three are the category of those are all spiritual things. And the other three are all physical things. And the point that I'm making is that while you're right to, to categorize those things, that's not Christianity. That's actually Platonism. Christianity would say in one category is God in the other category is everything else, the creation. Okay, so it's a bit of an eye opener to people to realize, oh, okay, so I'm actually thinking in, in Platonic thought. Now, if you add with Platonism, nihilism, um, which a modern version of nihilism would be like, like modern day atheism, that there is nothing beyond the physical. Um, so what is truly wonderful, our thoughts and our feelings, because there's nothing beyond this. And so make the most of right now of your inner person because the outward person is going to pass away. When you add platonic nihilism to this other category, which starts with um, um, Epicureanism, which is the whole point of life is to be happy. So seek after the happiness. And then you tie that with the Christian value of do unto others as you would have on, have them do unto you. You get what's called ethical hedonism. In other words, do whatever you want with whomever you want as long as they're also a consenting adult and that there's nothing wrong with you engaging with someone in any way it may be, whatever it may be, um, as long as, as, long as it's, it's legal. You get ethical hedonism and you tie that with nihilistic Platonism and you get the worldview of our culture today in America which is the driving worldview as to how we look at the world. What's disappeared aside from the golden rule is an overall recognition and, and presence of God in your life and what that means because the nihilism has taken that's, you know, out of the picture. If you're ever going to come up with a, a philosophy or a way of viewing the world, you have to name it ism. It, it's just, yep. it's required. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I I think you're you're right you, that that these things have sort of merged and um and it seems like um you know going back to the to the the book we were talking about um that people are following these um and yet still feel like something is not right exactly because it's learning this it's seeking meaning and purpose and value and satisfaction within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we also have this denial of the reality of death. You know, optimistic nihilism seems to jump over that by talking about, well, once you stop existing, all the bad stuff that you experience won't matter. So you can just, you know, it, it doesn't really solve the guilt that exactly. you might have in, in this place. I, right. uh, other than to say, well, you really shouldn't feel guilty. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you know, let, let's say that you, you murdered somebody. Well, I feel guilty about it. Well, you don't need to feel guilty right. about it because uh, it matter. once the world burns away, nobody's going to remember <laughs> that. 
Right. And so it's a, it's a, but what about the death. here and the now? Yeah. Uh, it, that's it, an interesting take. It's a denial of death and it's a denial of justice and it's turning everyone else into um, objects to be exploited rather than someone who is also an image bearer of the one true God and therefore has intrinsic value. The problem with optimistic nihilism is that it's so interned that not only does it, it, it deny the existence of, of God and that there's meaning beyond just your own personal thoughts, feelings, and, and opinions, but it lessens everyone else around you into, into nothing more than just objects for your own internal um, it, worldview to so be expressed. The problem comes when you're relying upon others to help provide a society that will allow you to feel as happy as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're just worried about yourself, but you may have noticed that that we need each other to make societies work. And so then that comes into the point where, where uh, going back to those intellectuals that were trying to just educate the world into a better place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe why this, uh, I ran across this YouTube site for optimistic nihilism that they're trying to educate people um, not to better other people, but to better their own circumstance. What if only I could get more people to right. be better educated, they would, provide a better environment for me and that would make me happy. And and what I and I guess the point I'm trying to get back to is that this is the stain. It's this this entire philosophy optimistic nihilism is basically lifting up the value that really reality is nothing more than 7 billion god wannabes. And everyone else is a resource in order to better oneself. Mm -hmm. Um well that's that's the original sin. That's seeing everyone else as resources for my own betterment rather than recognizing the value in every human being, which if you think about the greatness of Christianity on Western culture, it's this understanding that every single person is made in the image of God and therefore has intrinsic value and is loved and precious, which is a very different way of looking at others in order to better society. It's not about me gaining what I want, which the betterment of society allows for that, but as this specific goal, but rather that because this person is made in the image of God, and I also am a God bearer in relationship with God, then therefore there is goodness to be had that allows for freedom from this, um, this hole in us that is seeking meaning. The meaning comes from outside of yourself in the relationship with God. And that affects your relationship with your neighbor in a positive way rather than in a self-celebrating, self-strengthening um, uh, way by taking advantage of everyone. I mean, under optimistic nihilism, what's wrong with slavery? What What's wrong with genocide? You would, yeah, you would have a hard time arguing that they were bad. Right. Because everything is meaningless. Yeah. And if it's, if it's my benefit... For you to do a bunch of work for me. I mean, hey, that's how we made the pyramids. Uh, a lot of the <laughs> ancient stuff in, in the old days was made through slave labor. You can get a lot done when uh, people have to work nonstop without pay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I digress. But I was just thinking, I was thinking about the opposite, what we, our Christian belief then, yep. um, when it comes to others, instead of um, using them for my betterment, what? Do I have I'm, to talk I'm to trying to mic? motion you to be a little closer to your microphone, but okay, I'm not then. doing a great job it's at okay, it. Okay. <laughs> no, I forgot. But but that we that we help them improve their lives for their sake. Right. Mm -hmm. It's Which, love. It, that's love, and that yeah. improves everything. Yep. It's not. It's not like I want them to have an education so that my life is better. Mm -hmm. Right. But I want them to be able to improve their life. Yeah. So that, as a whole, we can care for one another. Th there is something about the gospel that makes mm -hmm. this naturally selfish person selfless for the sake of the neighbor. Mm -hmm. Like, I want my neighbor to be educated for their good yep. as well, that's not just because it benefits me. Right. That's yep. and 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 you know that's 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 love. Mm -hmm. It seems counterintuitive though, as we're trying to fill that that hole or that that longing. To say that 
no, what really fills it is not serving yourself, but serving others. Right. Uh, that that's counterintuitive for well everybody. I think. Yeah. But, yeah. Like what 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 would really make me happy is to think of someone besides myself. Yeah, and the thing about Christianity that I think is really counterintuitive is that it basically says it's not about you, and it's not about what you do. Every other philosophy, worldview, religion says it's about what you do, and if you want to be happy, follow our five-step program. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, do this. Do this weight loss program. Do this weight, weight training program. Follow our steps for success. Uh, um, pr- practice these pilgrimages. Pray this certain way. Think this certain way. Christianity says the exact opposite in that it says, you're the problem. <laughs> and God loves you so much, though, that he won't rest until he can be your solution. Do you think this goes back a little bit to our discussion last week? We were talking about uh, letting the love of God wash over you and how that can change um, your outlook on life and change the way you you want to serve one another is when you feel that that lifted but there have been points in christianity where we're, we've sort of lost that point mm-hmm. um and where we've sort of made it into a more of a rule system mm-hmm. and um i think some of these things can be reactions to that or or even that christianity has fallen into some of these traps at certain points where we've talked about um you know needing to live up to a standard right um, and so, uh, in order to to gain favor, and I think maybe some of these are reactions to that. Like, um, yeah, does God really need me to live up to this standard? Um, you know, I, I can see that some of these uh, philosophies might have come out of a reaction to that. Yeah, I think Timothy Keller talks about that too because he he points the finger at you know, the people who are supposed to be really good Christians, pastors. You know, mm-hmm. and it's very tempting for pastors to justify is that part of the deal because maybe need to rethink this (laughs) well it's the temptation is to justify ourselves by the work that we do in the church uh and 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 have that be our self-justification before god that god owes me something because i've you know this many people are smiling in church or whatever well you don't have to read too far into the gospels to realize that when when there were guys that said hey you need to do all of these things in order to be loved by god that didn't make jesus very happy no. he said i think you're misunderstanding what's going on here it was the fair in case you missed that that was the pharisees <laughs> that were <laughs> that that had all of those rules and jesus said no that's not how it goes no it, it the, the relationship create something new. Um, and, and it's a relationship of love. And we have examples of like, like family relationships. Yep. You know, my dad could and did tell me, go mow the lawn. And if I didn't mow the lawn, there'd be consequences. But the, my relationship with my dad wasn't based on whether or not I mowed the lawn. Or I should say his love for me didn't affect the relationship if I mowed the lawn or not. But there were consequences for me not yeah. hearing him and honoring him by doing what I needed to do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's like that well, in it's life. It's just part of being in a relationship. It's just and and all of the have tos that we make into have tos in churches is, is is they're not they're only have tos if we refuse to be in relationship with with the Creator, uh, refuse to be in relationship with God. Really, when we are in relationship with God and begin to live in in such a way that it's not about my self celebration, but celebrating the freedom that I have in Christ, living in that, that those have tos suddenly become want tos. Mm-hmm. You know, why wouldn't you, if, if Jesus is your Lord, why wouldn't you want to go to church? Why wouldn't you want to pray? Why wouldn't you want to love your neighbor? That's that. That's what what. Um, boomerangs back on us when we try to turn a relationship with God into have tos to be kept because all we're trying to do is fulfill that that myth inside of us that if I can just get God to do what I want God to do then I'll get to be able to do what I want to do and I'll have meaning and purpose and all those things so I mean I think what's so fascinating about about this book that we're reading you know he talks about that that whole that stain that that people feel that something's just not right, mm-hmm. 
And we don't have to look very far around our culture to realize that people are trying to fill that with everything. They're trying to fill it with, with a philosophy that, that denies that, that there is anything wrong. Right. Um, they're trying to fill it with um, a, a philosophy that says, uh, you know, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing besides what's here, and so eat, drink, and be merry. Um, but you also see that people are trying to, the self-help book industry is, is out of control. You know, the, the, uh, it's a huge, if you can write a self-help book on 10 ways to make yourself better, uh, that'll sell a ton. Um, you know, there, there was, uh, we were talking about the Olympics earlier. There was a Google campaign, um, commercial campaign on, and, and it was, uh, people asking, how do I, and they were all about making yourself better or, or, you know, doing something that would, that would, um, cause, um, that, that you could enjoy. Um, and we're always trying to fix that. But, um, I think what, what's important is that we realize that, that, that there's that hole and it can only be filled by one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's where we see the problems with, with these, um, um, and I guess that's, that's our belief system. And maybe because we've experienced it, we've experienced that satisfaction and that, and that feeling, um, that others are still looking for. Maybe <laughs> reminds me of a sermon I gave about eh, a couple of years ago. I won't say how many years ago, but, um, I, I said, um, is this you trying to pretend that we're still in our twenties? <laughs> yes, it, it really is. I'm, I'm deluding myself yeah. because of nihilism. Um, that um, don't worry. In five billion years, no one will remember how old you are today. Well, it, it, and I kind of swiped it from somewhere else because the original sermon was Jesus is like a Snickers bar, but I changed it to Jesus is like a Chipotle burrito. Nice. He really satisfies. Ah. Um. Because I I think that's true. I how think does that relate to sometimes you're hangry? <laughs> <laughs> well, without I don't know how that relates to hangry, but. <laughs> We're looking for satisfaction. You're not going to find it in all these things that fade away. I mean, the Bible talks about this a lot. It's why, you know, Pastor Becky mentioned uh, Epicureanism is mentioned a couple times in the Bible, and it, it's always in the negative. I think I, the one is in Isaiah where Isaiah quotes it directly. You think, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, but there's something greater. And I think it even had it like, you will die, and then you will be judged. Um. It's, it, it's that relationship with the one true God, the source of life that brings life and makes life full with meaning. It doesn't mean that it's without suffering, but it, it makes burdens bearable because there is hope as well. It's not hopeless. Um, I don't find optimistic nihilism to be very hopeful. Um, I, I hear it, and I, I hear where they're, they're aiming for that, but I hear it more as every, nothing matters. Everything is indifferent. So, well, the hope that they seem to have is in uh, maybe someday humans will achieve this, or right. maybe someday humans will uh, see the stars, or which, which is just fascinating. But it doesn't really have a lot of you know help for someone that's struggling right here on Earth. It, well, it's nice. It as seems a bumper like sticker, it only but when you when yeah. you think it through to its logical conclusion. In the end, you're going to die. So what do you care about what <laughs> well, and happens with this humanity? This is true. This is true. But it seems like uh, it only works if you're doing okay right now, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're in a, if you're making a good earning, uh, living. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're not, if you're content with where you're at. Yeah. Well, and that's why it 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 at least to me gives a sense that there is no justice, and there is no understanding or mercy in the midst of suffering there's only a denial of the reality of those things that you know it's like saying um um i'm i'm being beaten every day by enemies but at least someday my enemies won't exist so i can hold on to that that doesn't sound very hopeful to me no what do you think sarah i mean this is this is a very um I don't know. When you start talking philosophy, it's all very well, intellectual and heady, but what do you think? I don't know why I keep thinking about this, but I think it ties into a lot of like that stain and like hole leads into the like rat race of life of like, okay, I need to make more money. I need to get this and I need to, if I work harder, if I work harder, if I work harder. Yeah. But then when you like find the peace and the, like you just kind of slow down. Mm -hmm. Like, 
for I don't know why, but in my head, I'm like, oh, Christianity. It's like it's going from like speed swimming to lazy river. Nice. <laughs> like mm. <laughs> things slow down. It's like, oh, you know what? I'm. It's a content in your life. I, I like I like how you put that because I was I was speaking of hope, but you're talking about peace, mm-hmm. and it's peace now. Yeah, and that is that is that is kind of like the balm that that calms out this this sense of anxiety that comes mm-hmm. with I'm not satisfied. I need yeah. I you know go 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 get get get. Well, and it's also like with the nihilism piece. I don't know if it's just my own <laughs> anxious thought of it, but if it was me, I'd be like, okay, one day closer, and then finally people aren't gonna remember every horrible thing that I did (laughs) or would you rather be like you know what one day we're all just going to get to know hope and peace and sunshine and rainbows and unicorns and things are going to be good yeah well and you just touched on something that got me thinking about the the other piece about Christianity is that Jesus coming as your savior knows all the horrible things that you've done and loves you anyway Mm -hmm. and takes upon himself your sinfulness, your mistakes, your loss, your hurt, and gives you all of himself. And to me, that's much more comforting than, well, someday. Someday people will forget. Someday this worthless <laughs> sinner will be, you know, uh, worm food and it won't matter. Yeah, there is, I, I, I mean, I I just watched uh, a movie where there was a guy who did something horrible in his early 20s and then spent his whole life trying to make up for it. Jungle Cruise? No. Oh, I was like, I just saw Jungle Cruise. Oh, That's kind of that like the, that. Is that basically like that? Spoiler that alerts. <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, it was. Uh, it was called Inside Man. Okay. Uh, it's a. It's an older movie, but it was a Spike Lee movie. Um, and it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a bank owner that uh, 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 took advantage of World War II uh, and worked with the Nazis and became rich, and then spent the rest of his life. Uh, um, trying to alleviate that guilt from himself by being a humanitarian, by doing all of these good things. And finally his sin came out at the end of the movie. And, um, you know, I, how do you not, um, how did, how do they compensate for someone that just can't let go of that guilt that feels that guilt all mm-hmm. the way through? So, you know, you, you can't just say to yourself, Oh, don't worry in 5 billion years, mm-hmm. nobody will remember it. Obviously, that that he carried Wait, that around mm-hmm. with him. You're remembering that right now. Mm-hmm. How does that help you now? Yep. Yeah. Uh, optimistic nihilists wouldn't understand this nihilists, um, because it involves Jesus Christ mm-hmm. and it involves Him filling us. And so, um, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there it is, right there. How we can fill the whole but we need to introduce him to someone, Mm -hmm. to people who are, that's our job. Through him, we also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. There's hope right there. And and we have to acknowledge God in order to have the joy of hope. Not only Mm -hmm. that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, and that's really hard for people to do. Um, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Mm -hmm. And hope does not put us to shame. And again, it's because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So there is no hope for me aside from my faith, you know, it yeah. just it, it isn't it isn't and I and and I feel badly for people who think that why hope anything because for these people hope is just for tomorrow I hope I get I hope someone does something yeah. for me and it's a it's a betting hope it's gambling right right and the hope we have and we talk about this is a certain hope it's it's the promise of a future yeah and that's what this the, the optimistic nihilism has no future. It right. only has today. Yeah. And hope that we talk about in Christian hope has tomorrow yeah. and the next and eternity, whatever happens to us. I, I love that. I mean, that's you went to Paul, and, and Paul, yeah. s- Paul would say that if Christ is not risen, we Christians are the most to be pitied because our hope is in something that 
it, it, it is a lie. <laughs> you know, and and but what you just said is that you know maybe people don't get this about Christians, but mm-hmm. Christians are not perfect by any means. We st- we you can't be a Christian without first admitting you're a sinner. And to admit you're a sinner means that you're broken and you need a savior. Um, but none of us are resurrected, which means none of us are perfect. Instead, the Christian lives by hope in the resurrection, in the life to come. Um, and we trust that God is good in redeeming his creation, which is broken, which is stained. Um, the stain doesn't get washed away. The stain instead gets taken upon Christ himself. He takes the stain away from us. Uh, and makes us new in him. I just think that this beautiful line, because God's love has been poured into our hearts, mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit. Um, God's love filling yeah. the emptiness. God's love mm-hmm. filling the hole. God's love. Satisfying. Remo- removing the stain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. There you go. Any last words, Mark? <laughs> no, no. I, you know, um, um, I think um, having, I, I was just re- reflecting on that search for contentment and peace and that different people are going at it different ways. Um, and every time I've traveled to uh, uh, on a mission trip to someplace overseas or someplace that I would consider, man, I'm, I have it way better than they, they seem to have a sense of peace that I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sense of peace is just trusting in, in God and, and, um, uh, living in that community and in a way that none of these other things seem to satisfy that. And I, I, it's, we don't want to um, idolize the poor. Like that's a, that's an error as well. But when you see people who are dealing with real stuff. <laughs> no. And it goes back uh, to, to what Paul was saying that, that uh, suffering uh, creates uh, perseverance. It's, we don't yeah. seek it out. It seeks us. Yeah. But we're transformed by that. Yeah. What what I mean is when people are are having to work daily for their food, it kind of puts our our gripes in perspective. At least mm-hmm. they do for me. Yep. It's like okay, maybe my life's pretty sweet. Um, so when we when I traveled to Peru, people come back and say, "Well, what do they do to, for a living?" And I said, "They survive." Yeah. Um, and yet there are people. I, it's horrible being that poor. And that they do find joy mm-hmm. in, in life because they they are people the people I was other people of deep faith, mm-hmm. and that's what they that's the hope they live for. And yet we can have everything and still just have this huge have too hole. Much. Yeah, we have too much. Have this huge hole, and so I think it's called stuff, right? Mark? Yeah, we're just distracting ourselves, trying to uh, fill that hole, yeah, endlessly hole. distracting ourselves. <laughs> So where's the hope? And, it's and ironically, this you. all started with a YouTube rabbit hole, and that's how I got distracted, <laughs> and we came up with this topic. So those of you that are listening, I'm sorry for that. Well, and you'll be happy to know this is the last time we're going to let Pastor Mark Soldier yeah. on this show with rabbit holes. It's been uh, good to be here. We're back to our regular <laughs> scheduled programming next yes. week. Yes, hopefully it'll be as yeah. riveting oh. as uh, it's, uh, it is when I'm here. <laughs> Well, on that note, uh, I want to say thank you to Pastor Becky Lee and Pastor Mark Soldier for being here with us. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Sarah DeYoung, myself, Pastor Lee, and Pastor Soldier, thanks for joining us for another unput downable episode Ooh. of that podcast. You're just going to keep on sorting until you find something that <laughs> works am, right there. I right? am. Yeah, just got to find your right. word. Yes got 14 more that you're going to try out over the next couple (laughs) weeks thank you